Major John Ned in my camper van around one o'clock on Wednesday the 15th and I'm in Boca del Rio affluent outlying area of Veracruz, Mexico. Whole lot of condos with rich people. Rich people. A lot of condos behind me. You can't see them. Lots of condos. Down here is the Playa La Bamba, which to me is a very sad beach because it's underutilized. If you go a mile or two down the boulevard here, the Aquario, by the aquarium, there's a public beach, Via del Mar, which is teeming with human life of all classes, all shades from Blanca, white, light-skinned Latinos to very dark indigenous people. And when I was there two days ago, the fact that there were genuine indigenous women who had been brought there by their niece or granddaughter <coughs> in their traditional native long dresses, in, wading in the water, squealing with delight, I went, yes, I'm getting close to the native culture. And even the government is waking up to the fact that Mexican culture needs the contribution of the indigenous people after centuries of them being oppressed. But this beach, no, in the affluent neighborhood, nobody goes to the beach because the people in their condos, they go to breakfast. Yeah, they go to breakfast and they have tater tates. They chat. They don't have any time to go back to oneness. That was silent. The beach, the waves makes you quiet inside. It's almost impossible to resist it. Your mind gets quiet. And that's very threatening to middle-class people because it confronts them with the shallowness and emptiness of their lives, the front that they're putting on of looking good. So they don't go to the beach, they don't walk. If you see people walking the beach down there, they probably are a vacationer in one of the hotels or someone from the city who did go the extra distance to have a... Actually, the beach at uh, Villa del Mar was just as nice, just as nice. And they all have views of Ila de Sacrificio. S at the end, Ila de Sacrificios, and I still don't know who was sacrificed there. But uh, it confronted me with how close that was to here because from the aquarium via Del Mar beach, you had a perfect view. Here we're closer, it's directly across from us. But you, and I said, wow, I'm awfully close. The Boca del Rio. And you know, in Texas, I was confronted by the rich neighborhood, affluent neighborhood, and the poor neighborhood it would be just opposite sides of the street, just one block separating them, but different, totally different life experiences and different valuation by the society. So that's where I'm at. Uh, last night in the darkened car, having come back here from some errands, uh, I did installment number one of what I have promised my friend Kristen that she offered me an article that contained her assessment of what is spirituality based partly on an out-of-body experience so she had a powerful spiritual experience and after listening to it I went it does not make sense to give up thumbs up or thumbs down does not make sense to say here's where I agree with you here's where I no don't 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 go that that's disrespectful pick it apart like that the only thing that is making sense to me is to lay out mine and I've had out of the body experiences and I talked about them in installment one I made a 25 13 minute I don't know a tape that ran out of memory which always happens in my iPhone because I have so many videos in it. But oh, it, was, it was already 25 minutes. It already, I, I said to her when I shipped it to her this morning, I said, the iPhone decided to take mercy on the viewer and call it at 25 minutes. But to describe a lifetime of spiritual quest, it's not going to be a short. <coughs> and here's installment two. And...
Glorias. G L O R I A. That was Van Morrison. Do you know that? Do you know that the original Gloria was Van Morrison with his original rock band? What a whole different thing there. The Glorias are glorious ice cream. Fruit, fruit and juice and a month's worth of sugar. And they are pretty wonderful. And they all, at least down in the marina area, they all come out of the same big parking lot. They all gather there, all the, all the bicycle carts and stuff like that all gathered there in the morning. So, uh, yeah, the, the main organizing theme of installment was, one was, it's not about me. That's the central theme of my spiritual progress, such as it is, is to really more and more get it that it's not about me. It's sure not about my John Madden story. It's about who I really am, which is underneath that. And I started to broach the whole topic of how spiritual and emotional suffering got me closer to who I really am. And I was just telling the story. I just had initiated the story of the time I did a serious suicide attempt. Uh, and I'm not going to try to fill you in. You, you, have to, you have to listen to that one for this to make sense. Uh, and I'll put a link to it. But 30 years of being diagnosed as bipolar when I was not taking horrid drugs, psychologist myself, humiliated, shamed. An extrovert became an artificial introvert because I was didn't want to initiate towards people. At one point, I was poor a lot because I was not able to do my high power corporate work. And at one point in Chicago, I got all my medical care through Medicaid, which would not cover any heroic dental efforts. All they would do is pull a tooth. So I had a lot of teeth pulled in Chicago. And at one point in Nashville, I had another one pulled and I had a missing front tooth. And here in Mexico, that doesn't make people shy. In Appalachia, that doesn't make people shy. But uh, it made me shy and one of my best friends when she said, me and Tom want to give you $1,300 to get dentures because the thing we've noticed is you stopped smiling. You perform your poetry at Jubilee where we all went, but you don't smile anymore. And I'm known, known for my smile. So I was suffering, I was suffering a lot. And what I realized in the four years since I woke up and got happy, insanely happy, all the, all the time, no matter what, no matter if I'm grieving, it's all right. I know that I'm getting shit out and I'm gonna be fine. Uh, under the hood, I kept working. I kept doing all the spiritual growth, all the meditation, everything, 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 the dancing that could help me, finally did help me get shot out of a slingshot, but I wasn't bearing the fruits of it. And I didn't get to feel good for 30 years. And the drugs made it impossible to. The mood stabilizer drugs, my one psychiatrist said it honestly. They take off your bottom, they take off the top, and they kind of blur out everything in between. It's really, that, she said that's just the honest case. He, he talked straight, which most psychiatrists would never talk that straight. So, but, uh, I want to organize this chapter around the theme of, I said the first chapter was, it's not about me, but inevitably as a human being walking around in the world having dualistic experiences, subject, object, you cannot in this world go into a state of oneness with an oncoming truck. No, you say, I'm going to let that object stay different than me. I'm, I'm going to stay out there, I'm going to get the fuck out of the way of this truck. Yeah, so inevitably you have to have a, a human experience, your spiritual being having your human experience. And you do get identities, not only the John Madden ha handle, and in Asheville I took a new handle, Majo, which Yahoo gave to me, 
and they from that and then J.O. from John. And in 16 years in Asheville, if you had said John, people would say, who's he? It was Majo. It was on my name tags in my working class jobs that I only did solely. So I had lots of identities. I have in my life. When I was born, nine months in, nine years into my parents' marriage, I was the miracle baby. And the uh, two identities I got from my mother were you're the prince, you can do anything you want to do, and you are an ongoing disappointment to me. Because I didn't go to medical school, I just, just, just got a PhD in clinical psychology. And, but really the, the deal was I never made her happy and she'd come up with lots of reasons. I was the class clown at school, I'd get in trouble at school. But really it was because she was unhappy. She was a sad person who was angry at her husband, frigid, so wounded by the Irish Catholic Church. So she was unhappy and I was supposed to make her happy and I could not. And then, you know, I took the exact same bargain with my wife. One night we were laying in bed, we did not have sex before marriage because she was Catholic. We, we both kind of were, but she really was. And we did this very foolish, very immature uh, exercise where we said, what do you want from me? And what I wanted from her was her peace because I was kind of a hyper guy and she was more grounded, more in her body. She, what she wanted from me was my happiness, my enthusiasm. As if I could do that for her and she never forgave it. Also, my mom finally did, but I don't think Sandy has still, uh, that it wouldn't make her happy and then that I finally left her. So the first identity was you're the prince and you're a disappointment. Then I became an overachiever. I was a class clown in elementary school and top student. Uh, my identity as the rebel and the truth teller kicked in only in college. And uh, there's a seminal memory that went to a Jesuit college in Loyola and the Jesuits are big brains and pretty liberal. And actually Loyola has become, I visited there two years ago when I was in Chicago and they're so devoted to teaching people to be world changers, to have a commitment to the world. Pretty great. Yeah, my brother went to Jesuit College in St. Louis. And same thing there, I visited there on my travels. Same deal. They really work at helping you know that you can't just go out there and succeed. You have to make a difference. Uh, but I became the rebel. Uh, Jesuit priest, I think he, I want to say Father Nuremberg, but I'm not positive about that follows me out in the hall. I, you had to take theology classes at Loyola, and I took one that was the proofs for the existence of God, and there were these super analytical, logical games that were supposed to prove that there is a God. And I was, at that point, calling myself an agnostic, not an atheist who says, I'm sure there's nothing out there, but I don't know, I'm confused. After having been pretty Catholic, five years of the Catholic seminary, Father Nuremberg follows me out in the hall and says, John, after the final exam, tell me, do you not now, because I was the thorn in his side in that class, do you not now accept the proofs for the existence of God? Really sincere. He really wanted to get a yes. I said, no, no, it's a lot of gobbledygook. No, it doesn't prove jack to me. I didn't say it. That's the way I would say it now. I'm sure I was more polite. But I said, no, told the truth. I went on to a career of being a truth teller. Yeah. Still a pleaser, still a nice guy who wanted to make people happy, but a truth teller, and I would do courageous things. If someone was in danger, I would show up. And there's a great podcast from the Throughline people at NPR that says, it's about the nature of human nature, and it says, there's a theory, the thin veneer theory says that people are natural savages and it's only society that keeps them in check. And they said, there's a lot of data that suggests the opposite, that when the chips are down, people show up for each other. Their natural goodness, their sense of connection with other humans comes through. And that's true of me. 
That's true of me. My son was with me. He was like three or five, hand in hand, walking through uh, some kind of an art festival. And some big lug was threatening his girlfriend or wife or he was really menacing her. And I just stepped between them <laughs> and said, no, 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 you can't do this. Stop. And he stopped. And it happened again at the end of the festival. It was happening again. I did it all over again, and Terry never got nervous. I was so in charge of that situation that he never got scared. That, that, that was, you know, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't riding around like Billy Jack, but when the chips were down, I would do that. And I was the truth are, and became known for many years, for many years, people in all different social circles, people would say, you're the one that names the fucked up thing in the room that nobody wants to talk about. You just name it. Part of it was Chicago. That's a Chicago thing. Gritty, real, no pretense. Mr. Real, Mr. Gritty, Mr. Yeah. But still trying, still trying. And so then my next identity was mental. Oh, and so I succeeded like crazy in clinical psychology and then especially as management consulting. Walked into the largest company in the world, AT&T, where organization development consulting, the human side of business, had been an established function around that place for a long time. They knew it and you could, you could walk in and do some pretty wonderful things with the team. And because I had such a background with men Six Brothers, Seminary, Fraternity. I know men and I love men. And I could say to a very powerful manager, Joe, I've been talking with your people. Here's where you're fucking up and here's what you got to do. And they would listen. They would listen. My girlfriend, Mary Linders, when I went from being a psychologist, four years at a VA, very tough VA hospital on the west side of Chicago, said, uh, you know, most people won't know why your four years at the VA prepared you to work at at and I know. It's because you know they won't hit you. <laughs> I did get hit. I did get injured in the VA, and it's true. It's true. I knew. I, I knew. It was buster, buster, so what? <laughs> Doesn't bother me. So the, the star, I was the star of the OD department, even though I had no business background. I was top rated every year, the 21, and they were stunning people doing the work there in four different regions. Big success. Cincinnati Gas, terrible company, big success again. But then I got fired because my boss was threatened by me. And being closer to my son in Cincinnati, 100 miles away instead of 300 miles from him, Louisville, me in Chicago, just made me hurt more about having to say goodbye to him twice a week. I wasn't in Chicago with all my supports and my sex abuse memories came back and uh, I hit bottom and uh, got diagnosed as clinically depressed and then later bipolar. So for 30 years, my identity was mental patient. Me, a psychologist who never would give a label because I thought it was barbaric to give people a label like that. I'd give it for insurance purposes. No, I wore it, not proudly, but I believed it. I believed that there was something biochemically wrong with me, flawed, essentially flawed. And I was ashamed of myself. Then take my teeth away, <laughs> it was worse. I still functioned, I still got identified as enthusiastic, I still would dance, I still would sometimes be the life of the party, but I was so suffering inside. Then, it snapped, I hit bottom. If you know Eckhart Tolle's story is very, very similar. Hit bottom, was ready to quit, turned it over, and life said, good, we've been waiting for you to do that, Jack. Stop struggling and turn it over. Okay, we got it now. And the, the voice for spirit took over and coaches me in everything, pretty much. How to cross the stream, all the stuff. How to run the conversations. Uh, I'll be walking to have a conversation with somebody and life says, shut up. 
don't rehearse, I'll coach you. They'll say something, and based on that, you'll say something. And that's the way I shoot videos. I'll say something, and life will say, okay, now say this. Yeah. So when that happened, I was really bewildered because I, boom, instantly became happy. And I said to my men's group, it was long distance at that point, what happened to me? Did I get enlightened? I don't even like that word. It's kind of classist. They yell, you know, it's like, who's, who's up and who's down? And we're rating everybody how enlightened you are. And we from the men's group came back with the definition from Michael Singer, the untethered soul. And that whole notion of being untethered has been really useful to me, even though I wouldn't read the book because it was so intellectual. The definition of that book was un unreasonable happiness. Unreasonable happiness with no reason. And I had that. So I said, okay. So by that definition, but I'm not going to call it enlightened. And I went to the mountains and embraced the Native American roots up in the Appalachian Mountains and took their line of uh, real human being. That's the highest compliment to be a real human being. And it's what I, it's on my card. It's my title on my card. And it always was what I was scripted for, but I'm, <laughs> I'm real to an extent that not everybody loves. And it includes really being the truth teller and really learning to be tough. Yeah, in a way I never was. Punched a guy. Went to, never got, we never went to jail, but got booked and spent eight hours in the lockup for punching a guy in Nashville for the right reason. For, but me, I'm never, never a fighter, never a fighter. So, real human being, that's my identity. Badass motherfucker, I like that. Part, but when I punched the guy, it was so that my roommate, black street person, brilliant blues guitarist Eric Freeman who I had taken in off the street wouldn't do it because he'd go to jail he already was on probation uh, and I said to him at one point you know I'm old and <laughs> PhD and white and you're younger he was 49 uh, and big strapping guy and life on the street where we're similar is we're both badass motherfuckers aren't we <laughs> and we were oh what a team we were what a team we were I said to him after that one fight, I said, you know, if we're like in a bar and we'd, we'd do that and there's a bunch of them coming for us, eye contact, we'll know who's got who. And you'll know that you got those three and I got this little dinky guy over here. <laughs> yeah. So, identities. But none of them are true that's the secret none of them are true and i just a couple hours ago was sitting out here agonizing about you know i walk around knowing that i'm one with everything and i still feel lonely and horny and still feel like the answer is to get laid or to have a girlfriend or several girlfriends honestly girl in every part and I feel empty and lonely and so longing. You know, if you walk around wanting stuff, you're found wanting, that's, you know? So here I have all these incredible spiritual experiences to get lavished on me. And most of the time I feel incredibly wonderful. But in the background, I'm always looking for a girl. You know, Ingrid Michaelson song girls chase boys chase girls it's pretty basic and i'm still in that story and there's nothing on one level there's nothing wrong with it but the fact that my my solid knowing that i'm one with everything gets corrupted by feeling that there's something missing it feels like and I, I ended that video which also got cut off by lack of memory i said what the fuck is wrong with this picture when am i going to wake up and I skipped it. I, I got so tired after that that I took a nap and then I've been getting ready to take a walk on the beach, which I'm still going to do before I do anything else because the beach takes me back to oneness. And I am planning to not hang out around the convenience stores where there's girls I'm interested in to get away from the downtown Veracruz with the nightlife. And there are big beaches, I understand, south of here, not 
not the uh, elite beach like this beach, but more primitive beaches and really beautiful where apparently I can park my camper van on the beach, which is my thing. I've done a lot of that in the last year and a half, South Padre Island and places like that. So to be, to sleep right next, I here I hear the surf at night, but to be right next to the surf at night and to spend a lot of time in the water and around the water, I need to get dried out. Where preferably the, the, a beautiful girl may come down the beach sometime and I'll say, no, no, she's not interested in you. Do not, do not try to decide what charming thing you're gonna say. No, shut up. <laughs> okay, another 25 minute honker, but maybe I'm done. Maybe I'm done, maybe there's no more. I mean, there's always incredibly more, but maybe I'll call it quits here. So Kristen, no more. She's not gonna go through all the stuff I sent her anyway. <laughs> I feel sure of it. <laughs> okay, fine.